it's an honor and privilege to be able to host such beautiful ladies with me and today our session theme is mythology and the session topic is from heaven to earth junior literature's mythology in multi perspectives so we are having a publisher we are having a author and to an dentist with us as well who is also right into the writing space so it's going to be you know such an honor and a experience wise so enriching so let me start off with introducing our wonderful set of panelists today so first on the panel we are having ms lalita bala subramaniam she is a science graduate from mumbai university and did her post graduation in journalism from bharatiya vidya bhavan institute of mass communication and management she also has a gold seal diploma in creative writing from writers bureau manchester she work, she has worked in editorial department of the institute of for research and reproduction icmr mumbai for few years before switching over to freelance writing so she is the author of six book three mythological travel logs and three story book for children on the krishna trail is her most recent novel it is based on the places and stories associated with the time of lord krishna's existence on earth lalita ji it's such an honor to have you here thank you so much for the wonderful introdu- introduction atishay at the outset let me express my sincere thanks to the um organizers of pvlf 2024 for inviting me to be part of this fascinating discussion with both my fabulous co-panelists uh, stuti and nitika and a uh, special thanks to my literary agent suhail mathur of the book makers thank you so much everybody so now second on the panel we are having ms stuti gupta stuti gupta has a rich experience of over 17 years in the publishing industry in the editorial capacity Having worked on close to a thousand books in her career, she has had the pleasure of working with the best-selling authors as well as debut authors who went forth and charmed the world with their stories. She is currently the chief editor at Shrishti Publishers, one of the leading publishers houses in India, and spearheads a dynamic editorial team to make books better. Stuti has an MPhil degree in comparative literature from the University of Delhi and ha- has always wanted to bridge the gaps between books and the readers. So, Tiji, it's wonderful to have you here today. Thank you, thank you so much for uh, having me here. I sincerely thank PVLF uh, for giving us a platform to interact with fellow authors and uh, writers and also readers. Because when we reach out to them in February or later uh, down the line, I'm sure they are going to get enriched with whatever we are discussing. So will we. And Atisha, mm-hmm. you've been fabulous in coordinating everything and uh, putting all of us together in one place has been a task. So nice. sincerely, mm-hmm. thanks to you also. I am delighted to be here. Likewise, likewise. It was a like it was really a great experience to be you know able to coordinate and be in conversation with all of you. So now, with not not last but not the least, we are having the third panelist as Dr. Nitika Modi. Nitika Modi is a dental surgeon by profession, also a spiritual seeker and a lifelong student of Vedanta. She has immersed in herself into an, into the ancient wisdom of India, unraveling the secrets of Vedanta and the modern world. She believes that a practical philosophy can empower one. to life when to live a life of excellence happiness and peace antim the last avatar is nitika's first book she is also an accomplished speaker who shares her insights and perspectives on various forums and platforms she lives in mumbai and her and with her husband ayush dr moli it's such a wonderful thing to have you thank you atisha and thank you to the team pvlf for me this is a very very new experience i've just only launched in august so coming from a medical world to the literary world it's a very different um group that i'm meeting um you know i'm so excited i wish i had done this a long 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 time back but um it's always an honor to meet um, new authors and co-authors and people as as well loved as lalita ji and you know those like stuti who've been in the publishing world for so long so for me a newbie to this profession um i'm honored to be sharing the platform with all of you thank you yeah thank you so much yeah so with that we are done with the introduction round and with right off the bat i'll be starting to you know just shower you with multiple questions and do feel like you know do expect certain any prompt question from my side as well so with first like uh, with my first question to all of you would be so somewhat or another like you all are you know well versed writer into the mythology genre so what piqued your interest to specifically write into this genre so dr modi why don't you start first yeah so i um i grew up uh, 
almost feeling that Krishna was a friend, someone I could talk to. My grandmother read the Gita to me as a child. And um, Krishna was someone I would have conversations with when I was alone too. I read a lot of his books in the baby format. I wish I was reading Lalita Ji was writing for our time for Krishna Tales, but I've read her books now. So I grew up reading a lot of stuff. And then there was a gap, you know, when life takes over and um, the medical thick books take over, you stop reading as much of this. But um, I came back. Uh, after my father was detected with cancer to reading up on spirituality because I think, uh, you know, you have to deal with some kind of pain when you have to really immerse yourself into something more meaningful in life than just leading a life that one is leading. So at that point, I started reading up a lot more and um, I had my babies by then and I was reading stories from you know, uh, ancient scriptures, and I would say I epics to them, but I would always make it more relevant for them in today's lingo, in today's language, and talk to them. And then when my son, um, the older one, was three, and he started going to school on his birthdays, as a return gift, I started giving books that I had written with him as the main character. And they all revolved around something with to do with our epics and our so and those parents loved it. The children enjoyed it. They always told me that why don't you write books for children? But I was too busy developing my, you know, my third child, which was my dental clinic. So it stayed with me. And later, some twelve years back, I started writing this. And uh, when I started Antip, it was a story of a Vishnu avatar, the final Vishnu avatar. Um, it just I had, I did, by the time it was printed, it was the 11th manuscript that went in because I kept improvising on it and improvising on it. So for me, uh, it was very essential that we write stories which are relevant today, but which have a lot of learning from our past. And we in India are so blessed to have so much of material out there. It just needs to be, you know, Purani Kahani Ek form me, you know, where. Um, Avatar and uh, the Lord of the Rings and all are getting their core material from our scriptures. It's high time we begin to put it in our format, even on the large screen, where our kids know more about their superheroes and their Chiranjeevis than going back to, you know, a Superman or a Spider-Man. So it was very intriguing for me when I got to know that the Kalki Avatar is going to be aided in his journey by the Arch Chiranjeevis. And each Chiranjeevi is an Im each immortal is a superhero in his own right, far yes. bigger and better than any of the Western superheroes, if I could say. So that's why it was very important that I write this story. It, the time is now for retelling of our epics in a way which is today, because Kalki Avtar, being a Vishnu Avtar, being born in the Kali Yuga, will have a lot of attributes of today. And yet, his essence, and he's rooted to the past. Yes. We all are. So that was the reason I had to tell the story in this way. Yeah, definitely. Very well said, actually. You know, like uh, being a millennial or being a person from today's generation, I can definitely relate to the aspect where we try to incorporate, you know, our uh, old folklore with modern elements, which is absolutely a great experiment or a great thing to do. So Dalita Ji, what would be your take on this? See, mythology fascinates me, especially Indian mythology and ancient folklore. I've grown up on them, literally grown up on them, listening to interesting tales of gods and goddesses from my grandmother first, and then uh, from my father, who was a very learned man. And um, I had a lot of questions to ask then. And to find answers, I started... Uh, to devour literature from the mythology, Indian mythological base, you know. And uh, uh, because I had a lot of questions to ask, I started to devour literature with mythological base. This was during my student days before I started my career in journalism. I'm now a grandmother myself. And uh, I started the second innings with storytelling sessions for my grandchildren. I could sense their excitement and joy, especially while listening to tales of Sri Krishna 
and Hanuman. I don't know, probably they were more interested in them. And now I was the, at the receiving end of their questions. I realized that the ancient tales had the element to arouse their in imagination. From storytelling, it was a natural progression to writing these tales. The thought of writing them emerged because as we all know, the families are now nuclear. And majority of the children in present times do not experience the thrill or the magic of listening to stories from their grand grandparents. You know, So my first book on mythology for children was Grandma's Tales of Sri Krishna. The feedback for this book was very fantastic. So it prompted me to write more in this genre, and I'm enjoying it. That said, every book I write has been a learning experience, and I'm constantly evolving my writing style to adapt to changing trends in uh, junior literature. You know, such a fantastic initiative or such a fantastic thought that you've taken now. Such such nice thing to, from you. So, Diji would love to hear more from you. You know, I firmly believe that I was handheld onto the road of mythology by various people in my life. And I sort of believe that I was destined to be where I am today. Uh, when I was pursuing my MPhil degree in literature, I could have chosen any topic for my dissertation. But somehow, it, it so happened that I ended up doing a, a thesis on Ravan's representation in multiple Ramayans. And as a result, I ended up reading about 10 or 11 versions of the Ramayana in translation. And with that, after that, when I went into my first job as an editor, I was made in charge for an encyclopedia of Hinduism, which again was so full of mythological stories and uh, terms that I just couldn't believe that there was just so much out there to learn. And the final, uh, uh, I think the, the, the last uh, straw was when my son was growing up and I had to tell stories to him, he would refuse to eat his meals without a new story every day. And when I went out to buy books, I would always find these uh, uh, Pinocchios and Cinderella's and all these things, you know, and I was like, it's not possible that India doesn't have any, you know, mythological or folk tales that we can't tell children. So one of the prime reasons I started digging these stories out was for my son. He was two at that time. Now he's six. He still demands a new story every day. And then he started asking me, Mama, please tell me that story which you told me three days back in which this happened. And trust me, I had absolutely no memory of what I had told him. Mm -hmm. So I had to start documenting what I was saying so that I don't look like a fool in front of him that you told me this story. Now you don't remember. So I started writing it down or recording voice notes of the, you know, pointers. That's how my first book, uh, Magical Mythology, the first uh, book for children actually came out. It was all a collection of tales that I had dug out to tell him. And they are very fascinating tales of uh, from the Ramayana and Mahabharata and, you know, uh, major epics and uh, smaller um, uh, epic uh, recensions also from the local uh, folklore. And it, it got a phenomenal response, I think, because these stories were unheard of. I even get kids who ask me, have you made these stories up or do they actually exist in some epic? And I have to tell them that I can actually tell you where it occurs, in which version. And I have these copies at home. So I think when people realize that it's a well-researched work and mythology can teach us so much, mixing it with the contemporary style, like Nitika and Lalita ji have also said, you pick up stories from the past, the mythology, and then you mix it up to make them sound contemporary. Their lessons become contemporary. So they know that they're actually applicable in today's times as well. It's not passe. It's not something my mother learned and I can't learn from. But I can pick out something more from it. I think I, I just hold on to that thread and I keep spinning these stories. Right, right. No, I, I do believe our generation could definitely get more and more of mythological genre, be it contemporary fiction or junior's literature. However, the this piece of literature is actually much more enriching in terms of morals, values and whatnot. So with that, I uh, straight away dive into my second question. So that would be like beyond fostering creativity, how do you envision mythology contributing to the educational development of young minds? And are there any specific cognitive or emotional skills that you aim to nurture through your storytelling? So, Lalita Ji, why don't you start first? Uh, according to me, mythology is a bridge 
It connects young minds to their heritage and culture. And uh, they can discover their roots, you know, and uh, bask in the glory of their rich traditions. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, reading mythological tales arouses curiosity, imagination in their minds. They want to know more, so they question. And when they question, they are encouraged to find answers, leading to a quest for knowledge. Another important addition is that they learn to analyze every situation. They, they have to analyze every situation and action and find a reason for that uh, action. So there is a saying, you know, that there is no event or uh, situation in this world that does not have a parallel in Ramayana or Mahabharata, our two great epics. There are lessons to learn um, about the right uh, moral and ethical values like honesty, compassion, forgiveness, courage, etc. You know, the Ramayana is an example for family values like respect for parents, for gurus, sibling love. I mean, it was a real example of sibling love. Everybody sacrificing everything for every uh, for their brothers or sisters. The right path to follow was shown by Lord Ram. The teachings of the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, from Mahabharata is relevant even in current times. You can find answers to uh, so many questions that um, arise from current situations. Thus, we can delve into this vast ocean of ancient wisdom and pick up pebbles in the form of specific stories relevant to that situation. Mm -hmm. Very intriguing thought, I must say. Oh, so, Tiji, why don't you take us further? Uh, you know, I personally feel uh, I'll give you an example of law here. When there is a uh, there is a point in a case where people don't know what is to be done, they refer to cases that have happened in the past and the uh, judgment that was passed then, and that becomes a reference point. So mythology for me, uh, I try to tell children and adults equally that mythology is actually a reference point. Like Lalita Ji said, you get an example of everything. What you take away from that episode is up to you completely. So when Sri Ram breaks the pinak bow in uh, the court to marry Sita, Parashuram got angry, but there were several other people who were happy about it. But not many know that Sita as a child had picked up that bow just out of curiosity to see uh, what it is and what it does. So not many people know that when, when you talk of equality, the thought of um, King Janak actually having that bow as a test for princes was because his daughter was mm. capable enough to do it in the first place. So you get equality. You don't have body shaming. So Manthara as depicted as a negative character. She's shown with a physical deformity, but she's also given, uh, you know, a logic as to some curse or this had to be done by destiny. So she became a medium to get it done. There is an explanation that you can give to yourself. There is a sort of understanding that you get about uh, uh, humans in general and how you need to behave. I think it becomes a very strong source of uh, passing on cultural knowledge, as well as making a parallel with practical learnings that you can take away from it. And I, I agree with what Lalita Ji said that when, when you don't know why something is happening, you're very curious about it. So if I tell my child that you must not lie, then he'll be like, why? That's his favorite word. He'll be like, don't do this. Why? So I rely greatly on mythology to tell him that people follow this example and they succeeded. If they picked up the wrong choice, this is where they landed. So it becomes a sort of a reference point for them, I feel, to uh, to ground themselves and to root themselves into um, be probably better choice makers in future. Yeah, definitely. And I'll be definitely honest, like I didn't knew the fact about you know, Sita Ji picking up a book. Yeah. yeah, that's one of the stories in my book because when I read about it, I was like, wow, and I had no idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like it's such a you know interesting story that most of us might not be knowing of. So, Doctor Modi, why don't you take us further? See, I just feel that um, reading mythology gives us context into our world, our literature, our society, where we are coming from. You know, today when uh, we are so influenced, and I'm talking of India, we are so influenced by the Western world and the um, generation today. You know, when I was growing up, 
we had a particular time we used to come home that was our time to come home and if we came home at 7 that was our deadline we came home but our kids even though they come home at 10 at night they're out there in the world on the net and on everything so there's so many outside influences western influences that they're losing touch with their roots more and more so basically for me mythology puts three things into context it talks about god creating men and not AI being everything. It also puts into the thing different relationships between the different gods and goddesses and their relationship with men. And then it provides a moral code by which we should live. So, you know, today ethics, morality, all these have vanished from school curriculums. When they were there 20 years back as part, we used to have something called as ethics and uh, morality as our lectures in school. They're not there. So it's definitely important to have stories that, you know, cover small basic things like we have in fables in the Western countries or in Amare Amar Chitra Katha. They all came with a little bit of a story, you know, so the, this, the child may forget the story, but the learning from the story always remained. You know, ki is kahani se humne kya seekh pai? that was the most important thing. And, uh, I, my endeavor is always that um, if we remain rooted to our glorious, uh, you know, roots and we know where we are coming from, we'll be able to go out there into this world and gather all our knowledge. Like, when we were studying in the Guru Kool, we would live with the Guru and the Guru's family and you would first learn how to live in a new family. After that, you would learn the skills from the guru. Whatever the guru taught you, you would eat like that. And then you would come back to, you know, your house and bring back all your learnings and take up whatever your father did and take up his career. In today's day and age, when we are living in, like Stuti said, when we are living in nuclear families and, you know, there's... The child actually needs a village to grow up. And I hope these mythology stories become that village for the child to feel uh, that he's coming from a very strong foundation. You know, he's got so much to be proud of and he's got so much to um, go back and access. And those moral codes and those ethical values are set right in the beginning for children because I don't think we have scriptures or spirituality we have to begin this grounding right from the very early ages in forms of stories. Like, I'm very happy that baby Hanuman ki stories are coming and baby Krishna because they're such deep, very skilled, deep values that we are teaching in those stories. So I think it's all very, very good that we are talking. And I have a problem hai with this word mythology. Because mythology comes from myth, and myth right. means mythia, something that didn't exist. So definitely, our two epics have been long proven scientifically that they all existed. And um, mythology, maybe, yeah. See, the Gita was just a few pages. Today, a lot of it has been built up. So from a few pages to becoming a few thousand pages, there's been a lot that we've built up. But the core of it is not myth. The core of it. ये हुआ था ये किस्सा था ये कहानी नहीं है तो हम अपने किस्से कैसे कहानी की तरीके से पेश कर सके विथ अ सीख किस्सा कहानी और सीख इन तीनों को थ्रेड करना इज व्हाट द इंडिवो वुड बी विद द यंगर जनरेशन आई फील राइट राइट एक्चुअली आई एम वेरी मच अलाइन विद यू अबाउट द टर्म यूजिंग मिथोलॉजी फॉर आवर फोकलोर एंड डेफिनेटली यू नो मच मोर वर्ड और यू नो मच मोर coin term could be you know formed later on so yeah so with that we come to our next question so crafting stories uh, for a junior audience involves a delicate balance so how do you approach the narrative like you know structure and language to make complex mythological tales accessible and captivating for children so this is why i want to start first I'm going to start with rolling my eyes at this, you know. Oh God, this is actually the toughest part because in mythology, one thing will lead to the other. One story is interlinked to some other. And when you start telling them one story, they'll be like, Ye kaun hai? Ye kahan se aaya? 
अब इसमें ऐसा क्यों हो रहा है एंड लाइक नहीं ये पहले ऐसा हुआ था इसलिए देन आपने मुझे वो क्यों नहीं बताया आई थिंक प्राइमरली बिकॉज ऑफ दैट आई थिंक रामायण रिमीन्स एन ईजियर टू नरेट स्टोरी फॉर्म फॉर किड्स दैन महाभारत बिकॉज इट्स जस्ट वेरी कॉम्प्लेक्स फॉर इवन आस टू अंडरस्टैंड इन लीनियरिटी बट I think the formula that I picked up was clearly that I write whatever I would say out loud when I am narrating a story to a child, and assuming that the child knows nothing about it. So when you start from ground zero, you fill in the gaps on your own, and you create uh, narratives that uh, actually fill it up for them. Because if I assume that they have some sort of knowledge already, then you because I have read a lot, and I would know, you know, more than a child would perhaps right now. Though I'm still learning. so that's that's my go to formula i assume that the person who i'm narrating the story to knows nothing about mythology or the topic that i'm talking about and secondly i would narrate it uh, i would write it down in a way that i would actually narrate it in person so my books are full of you know then what happened you can't even imagine what he did after that so you know some people actually say that it, it when we just read out what you've written it feels like we are narrating a story so a lot of parents came to me and said ki we don't know how to tell stories but when we read it out it sounds like storytelling our kids are so impressed and we are so glad that you wrote it so casually and um, in an easy going way so i think that that works for me that way yeah i definitely think that you have intrigued a child's interest through the storytelling game yeah so dr modi would love to hear from you as well So you know, I think today the children have access to even their iPads, small phones, and they're seeing everything in a very visual way. A lot is being con- communicated to them visually, so very little is left for thought. So when I was writing, I, which is why it took me so long, I wanted to visualize everything. So my my entire landscape is very visual. If I'm describing any character, I'm describing a character. i describe it down to the t so that you know the child or the uh, reader can absolutely form a picture so now when they're able to visualize what is being communicated it becomes a lot easier and and then you tell the story in a very simple way you introduce two or three main characters every few pages and let them get used to let them develop understand the emotions of that character so that's why simple storytelling strong characters very visual this is how i've tried to build my narrative in a way ki mahol create karo hamesha mere dimag mein ek hi word hota aata tha ki mahol mahol create karo so that you know they can feel the wind brush through their face when i'm writing that or they can feel the height of hanuman if i'm talking of hanuman create the environment so tell a simple story introduce only two three characters at a time so the, so that the reader gets acquainted because like stuti so rightly mentioned that our, um you know i'm my apology is filled with roj mujhe jab main padhti hu mujhe koi naya character naam aata hai ki are ye bhi tha how come i miss this character for 40 years of my life you know so every time you're hearing and getting to know someone more who played a very pivotal role which we had no idea about till you discover that character you know so the um, mythology i think is very inspiring very exhilarating and also a lot of fun so if we keep that alive um, in our storytelling i think we've got it right संस्कृत मीनिंग कमिंग डाउन so the infinite lord comes down to the earth in the finite human form of shri ram or shri krishna so that we can connect uh, we can understand and we can use the great wisdom and knowledge which is shared by him so similarly when we write books or talk to children we have to come down to their level to make them understand what we are trying to say but um, by coming down i don't mean intelligence huh? or um, our uh, children are very intelligent they are very naturally intelligent i would say 
what I mean is recognizing what draws their attention and what maintains it. As we all know, children have a very short attention span, especially the younger children. So maybe a few minutes or so, and then they get distracted. Now, so how do you ensure that their interest is maintained? So when I write mythological tales for children, I keep the language very simple. I use lots of illustrations. And these illustrations uh, make it a visual impact. You know, it gives a visual impact. It draws their attention and enhances their imagination. They try to imagine themselves in that situation. So the excitement is so much more then. Yeah, very uh, rightly say. Do you want to continue? No. No. Oh, okay. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Great. Yeah. So very rightly said by all of you, it is definitely a tough task to peak or you know to catch a child's interest and to you know have them stay to keep them following the same storyline. And through storytelling and different mediums, I do believe it is the right direction that we're headed into. So now with that, I come to my next question, which would be on cultural diversity. So given the cultural diversity of your potential readership, so how do you ensure your narratives are culturally sensitive, avoiding stereotypes while authentically representing the essence of your folklore? So uh, Lalita Ji, why don't you start first? See, um, my books are aimed at a diverse readership, as you said. And uh, as our country itself is diverse. It, it has diverse cultures. It has diverse traditions. What is believed in the North may not be the same as what is believed in the South. This is essentially because mythological stories were transmitted orally uh, from generation to generation for a very long time. It was only later that they were presented and preserved in the written form. So an ex if you give you an example of this variance in belief, I, I would say, go to the story of Kartikeya, the son of Mahadev and Parvati. He is believed to be a celibate warrior god in North India, where he is depicted. Whereas when, uh, he, when you go to the south, you see that he is depicted as a um um uh, with uh, as a person with two wives so that's such a varying uh, uh what do you say it's a variation in um presentation which is a variation in thought and belief additionally one story may have many versions for example the ramayana has so many versions the balmiki ramayana tulsidas you know, Ramcharit Manas, the Kamba Ramayana from the South. Each one has its own, um, you know, variations. The basic story is the same, but the different versions are uh, having the variations based on the regional folklore. So when I take up a particular story, which I want to write, I try to read as many versions as possible. And then I present the same tale, probably in a new way but I can authenticate it with a reference to the apt regional version. Very rightly said. You know, like every 100 kilometers, our way of speaking, our language changes, so does our story as well. And, you know, right. we draw, draw so much of commonality with the Greek mythology. Like, uh, you know, the gods and the folklore is so much similar to ours. So, uh, Suthi Ji, why don't you take us further from it? You know, I was that's the first thought that actually came to my mind when I heard your question that um, India has been so rich in its oral traditions. Mostly there used to be bards traveling from one place to another. So one place they hear the uh, prowess of their king, they create a poem out of it and then they move to another territory. But they realize that here it will be difficult to create that same powerful image of the king. So they pick up local dynamics and then they mix it into the story, and then they present the story to these people. So when we travel from the length and the breadth of the country, the same story changes dramatically. I will just give you a small example. There is a version of Ramayana called the Adhut Ramayana. It is more popular in the eastern uh, side. You will be surprised that in that version, when Ram and Ravan are fighting on the battlefield, 
Ram is hit by an arrow and he faints in the battlefield. Sita thinks that Ram is dead. So she takes on the form of Kali and she kills the thousand-headed Ravan herself. It's not Ram killing Ravan, but Sita. Now imagine in Eastern India, which is a very Devi Pradhan uh, part of our country where they worship the goddess. It is very natural for them to um, see the goddess doing the more heroic uh, act, you know. So they very beautifully just portrayed it in a way that the goddess is actually killing Ravan. So the evil is ending, but it's the goddess, not the Vishnu avatar who's killing. When you go down south in the Jain Ramayana, because Ram is one step away from attaining his um, moksha, he mm -hmm. cannot kill a Brahman. So Lakshman kills Ravan. Ram doesn't kill Ravan at all. And when I was reading these versions, I was like, what is this happening? But uh, my guide at that time... <clears throat> He told me that there are as many Ramayans as there are people narrating it. So if I decide to narrate a Ramayan version today, that becomes another version of Ramayan. It's just innumerable and you can't go on counting. When we write, like Lalitaji said, the more you know about these versions, you will find that the narrative tradition and storytelling has always been very inclusive. It is not exclusive at all. You think of the trending discussions today. You talk of feminism, you talk of gender equality, you talk of genders. We've heard of Shikhandi being a transgender in Mahabharat. And he, ha he, he had the most important position in the battlefield at one point. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been able to take out uh, one of the most powerful, you know, uh, uh, people from the battlefield from the Kaurav side. You also have Arjun who in their incognito uh, Agyatvas at the end is also changing into a female form. So you have a lot of inclusion into narration uh, from when, when these stories were uh, narrated. We just need to emulate and keep it going. There is no body shaming. There is always equality. People are giving equal. Even, even the Kevat who's taking Ramji across the river is given so much respect by Sri Ram because he's taken them across the river. When our gods and goddesses are not representing, discriminating be, you know, between people, there is just so much that we can take. So when we narrate stories from mythology, I don't have to work particularly hard in, uh, you know, take, keeping in mind inclusion because that's just inbuilt into these stories. We just need to bring it out efficiently so that people actually start noticing it. Hmm. Very right. Let's say. And an intriguing question definitely came to, struck my mind just now. Uh, like, uh, let's hear from Dr. Modi first. Um, yeah, so I believe a good story is a good story. It should appeal north, south, east, west, and the global world. The world is a really small place today. So what are we even talking about just India? I would want uh, our stories to be read by the world and they to feel as much a part of it. So if it's a good story, essentially, what is our mythology talking about? It's talking about the same thing, good versus evil. Basically, that's the crux of mythology, that how good wins over evil or what evil does on to the good. That is the crux. So we stick to that. Whether you go to the northeast of India or you go to the southwest of the world, it's same. It's going to, you know, it's going to attract any crowd. Any good story told in a great way, which has the main things, which, at, at you know, the human emotions are aroused. Arousing human emotions, telling a story as simple as possible, keeping the good versus battle. Today, I believe if you have conflict in every page, that will sell in East or North or West America or anything where there's a conflict happening between brothers. Ramayan wouldn't have been Ramayan had there been no conflict between, you know, what uh, the, the mother did to her own, you know, stepson. If there was no conflict there. So whatever, the great stories have all arisen out of conflict. And you keep that happening in each chapter, You, it will work. Second thing that I feel is tell why the, you know, every story is a reflection of what is happening in the environment outside. Uh, you talk to a child about what was happening in a time, you know, when, I mean, my little niece, my brother's daughter, she's two. And if I show her photos on an album, she goes to do this. 
you know, she's wanting to expand because they look at things on the phone and they know how to expand. So they don't understand when we are talking of things. If I talk of, you know, uh, to her that, you know, skies can be also blue. She's like, no, my teacher says sky can not be blue. It can be orange, green, purple, whatever color I want. Because these kids are being taught to think in a lateral way. So these things, these kids are not being taught about ki this is what good is and this is what bad is. They are talking that we all have good and bad and we have to understand and grow the good in us and try to realize where the bad is and try to quieten that down. So that's a great change that we all have good and bad and they have good and bad and they have good. So that is that is the essence. If you begin to talk that way, and this is what I felt I did in my book, because Do Antim is a story of Krishna and Vishnu Avtar, not Krishna, sorry, Vishnu Avtar. It is about an Avtar who's going to be born in today's day and age. He's going to be a world child. He's going to be traveling around the world. And if he's traveling around the world, he will have that, you know, that razzmatazz and everything that he has. So he has to appeal to an American as well as a Greek, as well as a South African, as well as an Indian. And how can we even subjugate India to being this small little, I mean, when we look at us from top, we're just a speck. So let's, I do not believe in getting stories down to culture and all. Yes, we must bring down our culture in it. We have to get that rooted. But let's think of 20,000 years back, we all evolved from the same thing. Shakespeare has said it that in the end, there are only five stories. In the end, there are only five stories and they are retold and told in a different format. So if we can keep that alive, good versus evil, stay simple, tell it to the kids in a way where they are allowed to judge. Today's kids cannot be told this is right and this is wrong. Because today, to ask this question was Ram right when he left his wife? How can you pray to, you know, so these are the questions that are arising from the younger generation. My 24-year-old son, he asks me this, that, oh, you pray to someone who left his wife? Do you think that was the right thing? And I'm like, now you answer this question to me. You know everything about Ram. You know why he did this. So you give me the reason that, do you think Mariada Purush was right in what he did? So he said he was perfectly right as a king because he has to set the example. But I think he was a bad dad and a bad father and a bad husband. But he was Mariada Purush. He may be a good, good God to us, but he was not a good husband. And you have to say that more. So I'm like, okay, so you know, the kids of today are very different than what you and I were. And we have to understand that and ex begin to explore our gods in a way where they are relatable. Thankfully, India may, we are not scared of our God. We build a relationship with our God. We don't fear God. So we build a relationship. So if we build a relationship with all our main characters from mythology, our kids will begin to relate to them in a way which is, ki nahi nahi, this happened, oh, what are you talking about? You know, they're embarrassed. What are you talking about? This? In a few movies lately, it's been depicted. And somewhere someone said this in one movie, that That was put in a very, very straightforward, it may be demeaning, it is demeaning, but it was put in a way that the kids talk today. So we should be able to give them an answer to that. You know, without having to say, oh, yeah. oh my God, we don't know why. Have an answer. Be able to explain to these kids in a way. So culture is the last of the things. I think if for them, it's more about right and wrong and their judgments of what they call is right and wrong. I think that's what we have to talk about. Right. <clears throat> Very rightly say, Dr. Modi. So with that, like I, even though I have multiple questions for you, however, time is running really short. So I have prepared an individual question for every, every one of you. And please feel free to share your expertise as well. So with that, my first question to would be to Dr. Modi. So Antim, we used to get their elements from Vedic lore, myth, uh, mythical weapons and modern technology. So how do you maintain a cohesive narrative while incorporating such diverse elements? And how do you believe this narrative richness enhances the overall reading experience for the audience? So Antim is set in contemporary today and yet we have 
are eight chiranjeevis immortals who are living on planet earth and this i am not saying this has been written and this was a good cue for me which was left in our shastras that the eight immortals are going to you know assist kalki in his role so now if we have such big yodhas you know so what i did was i right away started research on all eight of them i i knew that i had to build the kalki avatar from scratch because kalki avatar ke bare mein jyada kuch bola nahi gaya hai so that would be what my mind would gather up and get but i wanted to do as much research on what was already there so my eight immortals there was enough written about all of them and i had to make them relevant today so after i researched on them i understood who dealt with which weapon what was the weapon they used what were they so all and then i divided the eight chiranjeevis into three different groups making them relevant to today so like i said our four defense forces the eight four of the chiranjeevis are our defense forces so that is hanuman ji the sixth vishnu avatar parshuram the biggest of you know the biggest maha yodha which was ashwatthama or in sabke guru uh, krish uh, kripacharya ji you know so when i'm talking of all of these we know they are our defense force so they are here to balance the world when it's moving towards the evil i've also got in shukracharya and shukracharya is the guru to the asuras and he has the mrit sanjeevani mantra which is a uh, boon which has been blessed to him by shiva where he can bring back the dead so again i had this huge amazing canvas to play on where uh, you know shukracharya can bring back the dead so i'm bringing back the old dead villains i wouldn't you know like so we have indrajit coming back we have those who been wronged they are all coming back into this narrative because somewhere we all are a sum total of our roots and our past so all of us those who believe in you know this life energy just being transmuted it's never dying but it's going from one form to another know that we keep coming back in different clothes it's the same spark the same energy the same soul so it was very easy to tie it all up futuristic with science fiction i mean hamare to bhagwano ne 5000 saal 6000 saal pehle they used the uh vishnu viman and they used you know they had aerial vehicles at that time so writing in 2024 we feel we are oh very tech savvy who knows what what happened 4000 years back and whether we have actually deteriorated on our existential curve or we improvised because her satyog tretayog dwarpayog aur kalyug ke baad wapas satyug shuru hota hai so who knows where we are and where we were whether those guys were a lot more scientifically advanced than us because they definitely did survive for a lot longer time than we do you know today 80 85 is good at 100 people are ready to spend their life's worth of everything and their fortunes to be able to live 150 years that's happening in medicine today but those guys live to be a thousand years so there was something they were doing right so we are blending what was going right with what are the influences today with somebody who is the bridge these eight chiranjeevi so if today i can't get vedvyas in front of you and wearing the clothes he wore then and in that but he will come you know probably as the president of a super power today vedvyas is probably that who knows so you know we've created that so like i said the four of them are our super um, they are our um, warrior force they are our armed forces i've kept two of them as our mental health keepers which is ved vyas and markandya kyunki um, kalyug ki yahi ek uh, cheez hai ki wo hamari sadbuddhi ko affect kar rahi hai it's affecting our brain so we are losing the sadbuddhi to know right from wrong we feel like i said the kids feel everything is right you know so that sadbuddhi so if we look at ved vyas and markandya ji they are our mental health keepers and then we have our fortune keepers which are kept in the two asuras who are also immortals mahabali as well as vibhishan so this is how i've divided it and made the book relevant to today's generation 
Right. I do believe like this is a necessary multiverse showdown that our generation definitely deserve. So with that, uh, I come to Lalita Ji for our next question. So as someone who has contributed extensively across genres, so what inspired you to intertwine mythology and real world travel experiences in your book on the Krishna Day? And how do you believe this integration enriches the reading experiences for young audiences? Um, I love mythology, as I said before, and I love travel too. I've traveled all over India. And uh, this book on the Krishna Trail is my dream project, actually. Um, a few years back, when I expressed my wish to visit Mathura and Vrindavan, my husband immediately suggested, why don't we visit Dwarka also? So this comment, you know, it set a germ of an idea in my mind. Why not go to all the places that had the sacred uh, imprint of Sri Krishna's uh, feet? What started as a pilgrimage tour plan, you know, it took the shape of this beautiful, unique, uh, thematic travelogue. And the uh, journey begins with an emotion-filled uh, uh, visit to the sacred Sri Krishna Janmabhumi temple in Mathura, where the Lord manifested on earth in a prison cell. This is the same place where he uh, killed uh, Kamsa also, his wicked uncle. So uh, the, then they, uh, the journey traverses the narrow bylanes of Gokul and Nanga, allowing one to soak in the nostalgia of baby Krishna's pranks. You have temples there, you know, which uh, showcase each prank of uh, Sri Krishna. So at Vrindavan, it was different. The surreal ex experience of uh, the power of devotion at the shrine uh, to Banke Bihari and the magic and mystique of Nidivan, it draws the reader into its fold. Um, Vrindavan also symbolizes the eternal love of the divine couple Radha and Krishna. You find people greeting each other with a, uh, the term Radhe Radhe. And it's so, it's a habit with them. I think it starts right from the time they are born. So even a rickshawala, if you want him to move from a place, you know, you're traveling and you want him to move to the side or something, you say Radhe Radhe and he will move. So that sort of uh, devotion is there. We Then uh, we go to the Govardhan Parikrama. You know, it epitomizes the faith and belief of the devotees. It's such a sight, you know, to see the Dandavat, um, you know, Parikrama, which is being done by devotees, elderly devotees taking six months to do the Parikrama just because they want to do the Dandavat Parikrama. It is such a physical task, actually. Uh, but it, it shows you the amount of devotion they have, the amount of love and um, connect that they have with Krishna. We move on to Dwarka next, where the Dwarkadish temple stands testimony to most of the uh, adult years of Sri Krishna, including his reign and marriages. Bait Dwarka is where the devout uh, Sudama experienced the true meaning of friendship with Sri Krishna. The narrative then shifts to Kurukshetra, the, where the epic Mahabharata war took place and uh, Sri Krishna took on the mantle of uh, Parthasarathy for uh, Arjuna and uh, delivered the most important message to humanity to, to, through the sacred Bhagavad Gita, the verses of which are relevant even today. Finally, we reach Balkatit in Saurashtra, where an arrow from a hunter named Zara pierced uh, Lord Krishna's foot. Uh, the journey ends with a visit to Dehot Sarg, uh, where the final foot imprint of Sri Krishna is enshrined. The book spans five states, 12 cities, 85 or more temples, and has 105 photographs shot on location by myself. As I visited each and every temple here, 
So to add flavor and meaning to the text, I decided to intertwine it with the mythological legends, or you can call it the historical legends also, uh, associated with each temple. So on the Krishna Trail is a mythological travelogue. Um, it's a mystical travelogue for uh, readers of all ages, including children. The language is very simple. And I've given directions, I've given timings, I've given so much of detailed information. But uh, the, when I gave this book to one of my grandchildren, uh, they flipped over the pages, you know, they just flipped over the pages and stopped, you know, when they stopped, they said when they saw a story or when they saw a photograph. They then, you know, they relate the story to the photograph because the photograph is placed just adjacent to the story. So then it becomes exciting for them. And say, they, uh, I think they um, read only the stories and saw only the photographs in that uh, uh, book. Because uh, other relevant, I mean, the travel information which I had given or the historical information which I had given was not interesting for them. So my idea is to give some, uh, them something more to think when they visit a place. If they know the legend or uh, the tale attached to that place, they start looking at it with new eyes. I'm talking about the young minds. They start imagining, they start envisioning what actually happened there so many years back. So that is my idea to bring out this book. It is a guide. Actually, it is um, put in the form of a guide for people who want to take the journey, undertake the journey uh, in part or in whole. Each um, uh, place has been given as a separate chapter. So you can uh, go through each of them. And I've included the Sandipani Ashram in my, Madhya Pradesh also, where Krishna had his uh, teaching, I mean, he was in the Gurukul of uh, Sandipani Maharishi. So that still stands. Huh? And it's so beautiful to watch. And uh, the 64 colors which he um, which he learned from there. And um, I have included Nagdwara in Rajasthan because uh, though uh, Srinathji was placed in Govardhan uh, in Vrindavan, but um, during the uh, you know, the raids by Aurangzeb and the Mughal emperors, the, uh, the deity was shifted to Nadwara in Rajasthan. Rajasthan rulers were more courageous and uh, they were re ready to keep the, uh, the deity in their uh, safekeeping. So these things, when you tell the children, when you mention this history, they develop a... Um, a liking for history also. They develop a liking for that place. And uh, I would say even a, a look at, um, at a photograph of uh, Kalia Mardan, you know, will bring back that story to them. They know the story. It's not that they don't know. But when you see the photograph, you see the place where uh, it has actually taken place. You, they, it brings back that story, it brings back that nostalgia. Right, right. So, yeah, thank you so much, Vipraji, for such a you know, deep and intriguing answer. It was thoroughly enjoyed. So with that, I come to my last question to Sutiji. So the inclusion of puzzles and interactive elements in Vahana adds a unique educational dimension. So how do you see these features contributing to the literary education of young readers? And do you believe this enhances the book's overall impact to their mind? Um, see, technically, the core motive of every story is to leave us with something to ponder on. That is how we learn, not by someone telling us this is the moral of the story, but actually by thinking about it and cultivating our own thoughts about it. How do you ask a young reader to do that? I mean, I know Nitika is writing for older uh, readers. I write for really uh, young readers who just started reading full-fledged books, let's say between the age of five to eight years. So for them, everything is new. 
and how we cultivate that sort of uh, questioning attitude, curiosity, social intellect, cultural knowledge. There's just so many things that we are achieving through stories. But how do we make sure that they will actually stick to the book? It's only if they find it fun. And you give them illustrations. All my books are completely color illustrated. So they find cute illustrations of gods. And my latest book is actually called Vahan, which actually talks mm-hmm. about how these uh, um, well-known gods got their mouths or their Vahans. So my son used to often ask me, Ganesh Ji is so big. How can he travel around the world on a mouse? So then I had to tell him that he was actually an Asur and he was a demon and he lost a battle. So he became the mount. Then he understood all right. He was a demon. So he could carry uh, Ganesh Ji around. So like this, they had several questions. And to ensure that they stay hooked to the reading experience, I think games and crossword puzzles and they're introduced into these fun activities. So it becomes entertaining also and it becomes enriching also. Plus, I think these activities also become a great way for parents and children to bond. Reading for me has always been a very personalized experience because I always read books um, all by myself and maybe went to school and discussed it with my friends. But now I see more parents trying to spend time with their children. And these books actually become a very good way of doing it because they read it. Then they're solving these questions. They're taking parents' help. They are discussing their thoughts. I think it all comes together as a very holistic uh, growth uh, uh, element also as a mother I'm perpetually thinking so that my child learns something new I think there I come parallel to every parent they want them to enjoy but also learn in the process so this book is actually the bridge between both I've tried to bring bring, uh, both these elements together also Vahan uh, uniquely blends together the world of gods and the world of animals both aspects that kids are fascinated by, you know, Panchatantra or animal world stories. Animal stories are so fascinating for kids because they see these animals, they hear about them. So I think mixing up the two worlds and making it a fun and interesting experience for them is what uh, I think worked out in my favor. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'd just like to add to this that what Skriti was saying about these Vahans and, you know, the animals. And there's we have the Shiv family. And that's so amazing. So the points that we could tell all our children was look at the Shiva's family when they all of them are together with their different Vahans, you know, that they all have. Um, they are all actually by nature antagonists to each other. You know, the peacock and the snake and the rat, I mean, the mouse and the elephant, the lion, all of them are there, right there. And yet collectively they accommodate each other in this life and in spite of being of divergent natures they live in harmony and they live in complete peace so this is the family we want to emulate that we all may be very different in nature Mm -hmm. but in the end we need to coexist together and if we can do this in a family we can do this collectively in the world too because we are all very divergent we are all very different you would know that we are you know the lion is but and is completely he is uh, an enemy of the elephant, which is the Ganesha's head. Whereas the bull and the lion again don't come together yet. Everybody's sitting in there. So somewhere right there in the depiction of our God family, we are learning some very important virtues that live in peaceful coexistence, no matter how divergent you are. Yeah, you know, uh, I never realized like when you just mentioned it about. I never realized it started, you know, wow, how are they such such beautifully intertwined between each other? Yeah. See, that is what I meant when I said we look at the same thing, but we all take away very different things from it. That's what a child does too. You can't tell him that they will pick up what they want to see and what you guide them towards. It's just very vast and open for us to learn from. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, can I add a little bit? Yeah, definitely, please. Uh, you know, uh, children have diverse uh, interests. They uh, they like some children like fantasy. They t- some children like emotional drama. Some children crave for adventure or mystery. Now, th- the advantage that rests with our um, mythology genre is that we have all these elements in our stories. You you take any story you want, like. Uh, Prahlad, for example, he's the son of Hiranyakashbu, a mighty Asura. 
because Prahlad does not accede to his uh, command that his enemy Mahavishnu should not be worshipped, he tries to kill him. Now, hatred and pride are Hiranyakashipu's emotions, whereas pure love and devotion is the emotion of Prahlad. Now, he pushes Prahlad from a cliff. He later tries to burn him alive on a pyre. That is adventure. Okay? And when asked when his, whether his Ramayana is present every, everywhere, Narayana, um, Prahlad says, yes. This prompts uh, Hiranyakashipu to break a pillar from which appears the half lion, half human form of Lord Narsi Madad's fantasy. So this sort of story uh, resonates with most age groups in uh, the junior category. And you give it with illustrations, they are, uh, you know, they stuck with it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So with that, we come to the end of the session. Thank you so much, Dr. Modi, Lalita Ji, and Sukhi Ji for joining us. I personally learned a lot. I will definitely be going to show off this knowledge to my friends and family. So with that, thank you so much on the behalf of Frontless and the BVLA family for joining us, share your expertise. And yeah, definitely uh, for doing such amazing work in your in the literary world. So with that, thank you so much. And we, do, we would love to see more of you in our upcoming sessions as well.